Good evening. We're glad uh, each of you are here to this evening. We're looking forward to this new series that Pastor Scott's going to be leading, the Not a Fan. I'm looking forward to it personally. But before that, we want to worship our Lord Jesus Christ. So join us in standing, singing, I Will Celebrate. I will celebrate, sing unto the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song. I will celebrate, sing unto the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song. With my heart rejoicing within, with my mind. Focused on him with my hands, raised to the heavens, all I am worshiping him. I will celebrate, sing unto the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song. I will celebrate. Sing unto the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, a new song. I will celebrate. Amen. This time we'd like you to make a connection and greet your neighbors. Thank the Lord all of you are here this evening and our teenagers have made their way back, our quiz team, and we're glad for their safety here this evening. Uh, we are starting uh, tonight uh, this series, Not a Fan, and if you haven't already purchased a book and want one, uh, there's still uh, plenty at the, at the uh, Welcome Center. If you'd like one right now and you'll pay for it later, raise your hand and I'll have Chris uh, run it to you. Anybody want one of these? They're 10 bucks if you haven't. Okay, there's one in the back, Chris. Here, just take them all. All right, raise your hand if you want one. Jeff wants one. <clears throat> okay, and for you young people, we have one that's uh, uh, published just for you young people. And, and uh, you go to the welcome. Hey, Chris, go back there and ask Teresa to give you the ones for the youth. And, pardon me? Oh, oh yeah, 
Get it yourself, Chris. <laughs> Teresa's already in here. <laughs> All right. Uh, George, I'm ringing just a little bit up here. So, uh, Ushers, if you'll come, we'll receive the evening tithes and offerings. And it's good to have tonight Mike and Darla Else with us and also Chris and Melissa Robison. Uh, we're just excited to have uh, their, them with us and visiting this evening, former staff members of the church, and just uh, what a blessing it is to have them come in this evening. It's good to have all of you here tonight, and <clears throat> we trust that we'll have a, a special time this evening. Okay. We've got it all squared away now. Next Sunday's Alabaster Sunday in the morning service. Also uh, continue to contribute to the special opportunities for ministry to our youth and our young people by a special offering just designated for, for uh, Celebrate Life if you're going to give to the youth ministry or give it uh, for giving for the children, uh, children's curriculum. And uh, we just pray that God will bless you as you, you give. Brother Chris, would you stand where you are and pray for the offering, please? Amen.
Okay. Thank you, Rachel. I'm sure you can do this next one? It's going to take a lot of breath. Pick up a hymnal. Turn to page 251. Covered by the blood. Once in sin's darkest night, I was wandering along. A stranger to mercy I stood. But the Savior came nigh when he heard my faint cry. And he put my sins under the blood. They are covered by the blood. They are covered by the blood. My sins are all covered by the blood. My iniquities so vast have been blotted out at last. My sins are all covered by the blood. From the burden I carry now I am set free. For Jesus has lifted my load. Oh, the love and the grace I received in his place when he put my sins under the blood. They are covered by the blood. They are covered by the blood. My sins are all covered by the blood. My iniquities so vast have been blotted out at last. My sins are all covered by the blood. I can never understand why he sought even me, why his life blood on Calvary flowed. But sufficient for me since he died on the tree, he hath put my sins under the blood. They are covered by the blood. They are covered by the blood. My sins are all covered by the blood. My iniquities so fast have been blotted out at last. My sins are all covered by the blood. Now he comes to my heart and removes every care. He bears all my covering load. In a pathway replete with his love on my feet. Since he put my sins under the blood, they are covered by the blood, they are covered by the blood, my sins are all covered by the blood, my iniquities so vast have been blotted out at last, my sins are all covered by the blood. To live, live a perfect life. He came to be the living word, our light. He came to die so we'd be reconciled. He came to rise to show his power and might. That's why we praise him. That's why we sing, that's why we offer Him our everything, that's why we bow down and worship this King, cause He gave His everything, cause He gave
Else, if he'd come and lead us in prayer and 
We do want to give God praise for the protection upon our young people as they traveled this uh, Friday and Saturday and had to come home this evening, or this morning rather, and, and the safety that the Lord gave them. I want to pray for many of our people who are still ill and sick and just a lot going on in a lot of people's lives. It's good to have Mark and Mike and Darla and Andrew with us this evening. Brother Mike, come and lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, it is good to be here again with these folks whom we grew to love many years ago. And we thank you and praise you for the way that you bless them and keep them and continue to use this congregation in this community to minister. Thank you, Father, for the safety of the teens as they made traveling this weekend. And Father God, you know the needs of this congregation even better than the pastor and you know the hearts that are aching. You know those who are rejoicing. You know those who are anxiously waiting for something that they're anticipating. Father, I just pray that you administer in a special way to each one that's here tonight, each family that's represented, and hold them near and dear to your heart. In a little while, as Reverend Robertson comes and begins to share with this congregation what's going to be a series. I pray that your anointing would rest upon him. I pray, God, that you would give each listening heart ears to hear what the Spirit would say. I pray that your word would bear fruit in each of our lives and that we would become continuing servants of the gospel for your glory in the places that we go every day whether it be at work or these students in their school, out in the marketplace, Father God, I pray that you would help us each one to be conscious of your desire to be exposed in our life to a world that's watching. Help us to actively engage with you in sharing the light that you call us to live in. Father, I pray especially for this pastor and his wife and family. Would your blessing rest continually upon them and give them guidance in their leadership in this congregation. And may they know the tender voice of the Holy Spirit constantly saying, this is the way I want you to lead this, my flock, in these days. Give him the wisdom he needs always. And Father, in the rest of this service, we turn our ears to hear what you would say to us. And we'll give you glory. And our hearts will always say, Amen and Amen. Let's sing that chorus again. You are the one that we pray. Before Yeshua comes to sing, let's have the a little report from our quiz team. Uh, if you haven't noticed the tire that's out in the foyer, that's the tire that blew out Friday afternoon as they were headed to Sterling, uh, Illinois. And uh, we're thankful that uh, Brother Chris was driving, was able to keep it, uh, at least keep it between the lines and get it to the side of the road and that they were uh, safe and sound. After uh, this report, then Yeshua is going to sing. After Yeshua sings them, Brother Scott Robinson is going to bring the evening lesson. Ask my, uh, George to turn this mic on because here in a little bit I want to show some pictures. So I got to talk and flip and do all that. So. Um, I'd also like our manpower from the trip to come up here, Pastor Chris and my husband Derek. <laughs> and Devin, please. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, I don't even really know like where to begin explaining this trip, but uh, usually when I make our quizzing reports, I have very prepared notes of what I'm going to cover, and I, I'm like so all over the place of what I should even share. 
Um, and I know there's a lot I can't even share because what some things that happened in the van are staying in the van. Um, <laughs> but anyway, this, this trip, uh, our plan was to leave at 2.30 on um, Friday. And as you know, it started snowing at noon on Friday. And so uh, we didn't quite get out of here right at 2.30 because Derek was meeting us here and he works in Fishers and so he got here a little bit late and then um, so we didn't leave actually leave the church until 3 and then we had to pick up a couple of them and we didn't get it took us two hours to get out of Indianapolis because of the weather and then um, once we got maybe I don't know 20 miles north of Lafayette we the snow wasn't too bad and then we got 40, we were going to Sterling, Illinois, which is supposed to be a four and a half hour drive. And we got 45 minutes from our hotel and we had a tire blow. And I know some of you have seen the tire out there and that's what it looked like. And so Chris and Derek, uh, Chris was driving and he got us off the road very safely. And I was so excited that Chris got his license back just in time to help us drive on this trip. <laughs> and uh, so he got us off the road very well. And then he was um, on, we had a decent sized shoulder to work with here. And us ladies stayed inside. And the, these two here thought they would just jump in and out of the van and be of whatever help they thought they were. And so anyway, so they did get it uh, replaced and we were on our way and we got to the hotel at 1045 uh, when we had planned to be at the hotel by maybe six or seven, have time to swim and order pizza and yada yada. Uh, the hotel staff was nice enough to leave the pool open by my request. I asked them to leave it open till midnight and they actually did so that the kids could swim. So anyway, so then Saturday, the important part, we went to the quiz meet and um, and those of you uh, who haven't heard me say already, this was an invitational quiz meet, so it was a, a lot higher um, competition than what we face on our district. And we did enroll in the novice division, that even though that's not as, uh, as um, high competition as the experience, it was still more than what we face on our district. So anyway, so there were 12 novice teams, and, um, and in the morning you go through the preliminary, preliminary rounds to then find out where you place and if you will even be in the afternoon tournament. And we placed third in the preliminaries. And so then we went to lunch um, and came back and then we had to go through the tournament, which I still can't read this tournament bracket even though we went through it. And uh, we placed um, third again for the tournament. So, and we actually get to keep this trophy, unlike the traveling trophy on the district. So, so this is ours to keep, and we think that um, we should have a trophy case built next to our quizzing room because we're going to fill it. This is going to be the first one, so we're going to fill it with some more. And they each got a medal to keep, and, um, and so here's some pictures of us with our medals. They're fighting over who really earned it. <laughs> so, um, and I just, and then on our way home, um, we got into some more weather and uh, we were just going really slow and we knew it was, we probably wouldn't get in here until maybe two or three o'clock in the morning. And um, after seeing what time the Grace Point team got in, that's exactly, maybe it would have been later than that because we were driving a bigger van than them. So talking to my dad, he suggested we pull over, get a hotel. So I always pack extra just in case. And then the one weekend that I don't pack for just in case, I needed a just in case outfit. So anyway, um, but I do just want a couple other things. I just want to say that and I'll try not to get emotional, but I'm just so um, thankful for my team and, the, and even the ones who didn't go on this trip, just the unity and harmony that we have. And we didn't have any discipline problems. We didn't have any 
bickering, they all got along so well, and they don't disrespect us adults, and, and I'm thankful that my husband was able to go, and he's always kind of just been my behind-the-scenes support of quizzing, and he was able to be there on the sidelines with me and see, you know, why I have this passion for teen quizzing. And I'm thankful for a youth pastor who supports teen quizzing and a pastor, not just because he's my dad, but because he is a pastor who supports quizzing. You wouldn't believe the, di the churches on our district who do not support quizzing and, and youth pastors who just push it aside like it's not an important activity in the church. And our church doesn't see it that way. And I'm just thankful for the church that we have and the leaders that we have that see it for the important activity that it is. And I'm just, I just feel so full of, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just blessed for the kids in my youth group and, and the people in our church. And that's it, just thankful. <laughs>
surely alive. He's living on the inside, growing like a lion. God's not dead. He's surely alive. He's living on the inside, growing like a lion. God's not dead. He's surely alive. He's living on the inside, growing like a lion. God's not dead. He's surely alive. He's living on the inside, growing like a lion. He's growing. He's growing. He's growing like a lion. He's growing. He's growing. He's growing like a lion. Growing like a lion. Wasn't that good? Amen. Woo! Well, I'll get you going on it. I'm telling you, I like that. We're going to have to use that in our youth service in the back. So, might have to stand up and move a little bit to that one. I don't know. We'll just see. But, uh, that's a good song. That's a good God is not dead. He's still alive. Amen. Good. Well, this is sermon number one. Uh, lesson number one for us. Um, uh, let me start off with a question. Whose kid actually ends up going into the lemonade stand business, all right? <laughs> Whose kid really ever does, you know? You've seen them before. Maybe your child tried it once. How many of your kids have ever tried to do a, a lemonade stand, you know, whether it's in the front of your house or wherever it is? And, and they, uh, Most kids have tried that at one time or another, and we're the parents, usually the ones that spend the most money at it, all right? <laughs> Nobody else stops by, but we're the ones. Uh, some kid tries it one hot summer afternoon. Uh, after seeing some of the other kids in his neighborhood doing it, he thought, you know what, I, I can make a few more bucks uh, by trying this and, and maybe add a little to my allowance, so I'll try it. So he gets his dad to help him set up this old rickety little uh, stand, hand paints a sign, lemonade, you know, 25 cents or 50 cents or whatever it is, and after one successful day, he tries it again, and the next day, and the next day, and he just keeps doing it. Then he gets invited to go over to the, uh, the baseball game at the high school, and, and, and he comes up to this, and he says, you know what, I'm going to raise my price. And he raises it up to $2 a glass now, all right? Pretty soon, he's got a lot of invitations to bring his lemonade stand to all kinds of events, and he's getting really, really busy now for a young boy. Taking his lemonade stand all over town, he's making a really nice profit. Now things have got a lot busier. It's a lot more professional. It's taken up more of his time than he expected, and he's got to make special orders on lemons now. That's how busy he is. He has to keep track of all his expenses on a spreadsheet, and what started out as a little bitty hobby has become a very consuming commitment for him. In that moment, he now has to make a choice. Is this really going to become a kind of career for me? Hmm. Is he going to have to hire a new employee or a few employees to help me out with this now? What am I going to do? Now, some of you, I know you're out there thinking this. You know, maybe I should go in the lemonade stand business. <laughs> this, might be, this might be a good gig. I don't know. But in other words, you, I, I know you're thinking, man, I wish that was my kid. <laughs> I wish I had a kid that actually knew what a spreadsheet was, you know, and actually could do these things. That would be awesome. But here's the point. There's a moment in time when we all have to make a decision on things. Is this a hobby? Or is this a career? Is this for fun? Or something more? Am I trying this out? Am I really going to invest into it? And that's the biggest questions we have of life. These kind of moments aren't unique to the business world. They are certainly, uh, you see them all the time in our life, and mostly with our experiences in relationships. All right? So I want you to watch this short little video, and uh, we'll go from there.
DTR. Some of you will recognize what those letters stand for. If you're not sure, let me help you out. If you are a young man in a relationship with a young woman, then uh, chances are these letters are enough to strike fear into your heart. You may run away from, postpone, you may dread the DTR talk. Some young men will even terminate a relationship if they feel like the DTR talk is imminent. It is that official talk that takes place in every romantic relationship. Do you know what it stands for, DTR? Define the relationship. <laughs> you sit down and you decide where things are going. Have things moved from casual to committed? I remember this uh, date I went on in high school. On the very first date, the girl tried to have the DTR talk with me. First date, DTR. <laughs> I got out of their PDQ. I just <laughs> ran away. <laughs> All right. Over the next several weeks, we're going to nail that. All right. The DTR. And uh, for some of you this evening, this may be kind of a first date. All right. What I mean by that is you're not exactly really why you're here. <laughs> you're not really sure what this is all about. Uh, you're not exactly what to make of any of this. And, well, you, you just, we just want you to kind of sit and listen for a few moments. All right. You may not be ready for that talk yet. It may scare you. Okay. But I think for most of us here this evening, you're ready for that DTR. You want to define the relationship you really have with Jesus Christ. That's vital. Define it. I mean, spell it out. Where do I stand with him? So I want you to do this right now, all right? I want you to turn to somebody and say, let's have the DTR. Would you do that? Tell them right now. Let's have the DTR, okay? <laughs> Here's our starting point, Luke chapter 9, verse 23. If you can see this, read this together, all right? If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Say it one more time. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So many of us are really ready for this talk um, because we want to grow in our relationship with Christ. Amen? We do want to grow in that relationship. We don't want to just have this kind of messy situation going on, which a lot of relationships end up, especially in teenage years. They all just get a little messy, and you don't know where things really stand. We don't want that. We want it defined. We want it truth. We want it in, in right spirit. We want to be walking close to him. Uh, me personally, I've been a Christian for a while, but what I've really noticed in this is, Lord, I want to know you deeper than I ever have. And, and deeper may sound like a, a great spiritual term, but what that may mean is it may hurt. <laughs> it may hurt for me to really know where I am with him at times. And, and so that, if that's what it takes, I, I really want to know where I'm at and where I need to be with him in this relationship. So matter, no matter where you are, um, let this really penetrate you. Uh, we're going to talk about some uh, pretty pointed stuff. Uh, others of us, maybe, we, we need to have this talk. <laughs> we need to be here because we don't know where we are and we don't know what we stand for and we don't know what we believe in and we're struggling with some things and we've got some doubt in our minds and we think maybe Jesus is a nice guy. We like the church. Uh, gives us something to do on the weekends. Uh, and the people are pretty nice here. And beyond this, though, you get a little anxious in the pew when we talk about commitment. You need to be here. You need this talk. Uh, you need to hear what Jesus has to say to you. So the question for us, and we're going to ask this a lot, is are you a fan or are you a follower of Jesus? And as we go through this, you're going to understand what those terms mean. And, and here's one thing I don't want you to do, because I know you already did it. Jump to conclusions, all right? <laughs> You've already jumped there. I know you have in your mind, well, I'm a follower. I know I am. I've been in the church, blah, blah, blah. Don't. Don't do that yet. Don't think too quickly. Think about this definition for a second. The word uh, fan is defined as an enthusiastic admirer. An enthusiastic admirer. Uh, how many of us are Colts fans here? All right, we've got a few of those. 
How many of you are not Colts fans? Mm. Let's pray. All right. No, I, I love other teams too. I'm just glad they can lose. Uh, <clears throat> many of us are, are really sports fans. I mean, some are casual. Some are really committed uh, sports fans, though. Uh, we watch the games. We cheer them on. Some of us are, uh, wear jerseys of our favorite teams. We understand that concept in America. <laughs> if anybody understands sports, Americans understand sports. That's what we live and breathe, it seems like, so often. Uh, but the concern here is, let's, let's put all that into the church. Remember, enthusiastic admirer is that the church has the potential to very easily become a stadium full of Fans. Fans. Fans of the church. Fans of the minister. Fans of the worship. Fans of the youth ministry. Fans of Jesus. Consider the average ticket holder to the Colts games. And I'm certainly not one. I can't afford those. But if you were at a game, what happens? People attend. People come from all over the place, and they pay to park there. Can you imagine if we started pay, having people pay for parking in the church? We could really raise up some revenue and get you a new full-time job there, Chris. Man, we could really get things going. But they pay to park. And they, once a week, they come to this NFL season game. If you're a Colts fan, you say you go down to Lucas Oil, you sing the national anthem, may even have a moment of silence if some situation is going on in the world. So there's the time of prayer. You applaud. You raise your hands. You get excited or you mourn. <laughs> we'll get to that here in just a second. But you walk out thinking usually one of two things. Wow, that was incredible. I can't wait to get back next week. Or that was awful. And you're like, I'm not sure I want to come back next week. Think about that in the church world. And think about the people that come. We, we, we beg and we plead them to come to church, come to church, come to church. And they come, and then they walk away. What are they thinking? Well, they came just like a football game. They come together once a week. They sang. They applauded, maybe. They raised their hands, maybe. Maybe they even got a little excited, or they mourned, depending how long the service went. <laughs> and they walk out thinking either that was great, or I'm not sure I want to go back. Now, what happens here? We all get in the car and we all begin to evaluate what we just went through. We begin to evaluate, was that really worth it? Do I want to do this again? Who am I doing this for? We begin to evaluate the sermon, the service, the song selections, thumbs up or thumbs down. Was it really worth my effort? All right, I, I got a picture I got to show you. How many of you have seen this guy, all right? <clears throat> have you seen him? He is the number one Colts fan, all right? The number one. He is the guy. And if you could look at that closely, I know you can't see it all, but this dude is just like decked out. There is not a thing on him that's not blue and white. I mean, he is all the way. Now, hold that picture up there for just a minute, Lydia. <clears throat> I want you to think about this and, and draw a correlation here. The longer you and I have been in the church, the more we think like that. Now, here's what I mean by that. Who is the biggest fan for Jesus? Now, follow me. I know all the songs, the old and the new ones even. We put a feather in our cap. I know all the stories of the Bible. I've heard them hundreds of times. I could tell them myself anytime and anywhere. And what's fun even is I can open my Bible and I get that sword out. And buddy, I can whip over to that page faster than anybody else can because I know where the books of the Bible are and I can sing the song for you. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Put another feather in our cap. If the church doors are open, I'm there. Put a feather in our cap. I know how to do just about anything in the church, and I must say I'm pretty good at it. Last year I won the most humble award, <laughs> you know. I am so well respected around here. And we put a feather in our cap. And we, in a sense, want to become the biggest fan of Jesus. And that feels pretty good. That feels pretty good. Because, man, when people walk by us, when, when they see us, <laughs> nobody can deny that we're not a fan. Nobody. 
But let me ask you this. Did Jesus ask for fans? No. Jesus is never impressed with fans. And nor does he ever seek fans. He's not seeking for people who can look up scriptures the fastest or know the songs old or new. He doesn't care about that. There's something a lot deeper. And there's three questions we've got to answer before we leave tonight. <clears throat> and I hope you really grapple with them because <laughs> I have been. This study is really the beginning part here. And if you don't get this part, you're not going to really grab a hold of anything else. So I hope you really get this tonight and go further than what you're thinking. Number one, why are you here? Why are you here? If you read through the Gospels, and I know many of you have, Jesus at different points in his ministry began drawing lines in the sand. He began to separate himself from people just by the things that he said. He didn't want everybody always around him. And you'll notice that. And all of a sudden, he would begin to separate these fans from the followers, the sheep from the goat, and he began to do, just do this anywhere he went. He, be, he came with a sword, <laughs> and he began to divide people left and right all around him. And it was very pointed. He wasn't, he wasn't ashamed of doing it. He was just saying, this is the truth. You're either going to like it or you're not going to like it. Here it is. And he just kept walking in the truth. And then you just saw it. He separated people all over. John 6 is an incredible example of this. Uh, he, he is in the height of his ministry. And if you have a Bible, you can look it up as well. Uh, he's in the height of his ministry. We read that incredible crowds were following him, literally. And I, I can't even imagine that. Uh, you, you go somewhere. I, I, let's just say I'm going to go to Plainfield tonight. Well, all of you would get in your cars, and you would go to Plainfield as well. <laughs> and when I leave Plainfield, let's say I go down to Mooresville. You all get in your cars, and you go to Mooresville. That's what happened. And can you imagine having a few hundred or a thousand people or 5,000 people walking behind you everywhere you went? That's a pretty impressive crowd. Uh, this is no small thing here. He was incredibly popular. He was working miracles. He was providing food from just fish and, and, and loaves. To all reasonable logic the church was growing boy don't miss that everybody could have stepped back and said you know what there's jesus there's the 12 great look at the church it's big <laughs> it's amazing it's exciting look what's happening i would have loved to have been a part of something like that that would have been absolutely amazing but jesus in verse two he realizes why they're coming and i want you to look at what he says there great multitude followed him everybody say the word because because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased they came because you came tonight because. Because why? Um, if you knew, now let's just pretend you're in a room, just me and you. If you knew right now, no one, absolutely no one would know, would you skip church more? Nobody else knows. Nobody else is going to know. But if you could, man, you would love to just skip church just a little more. If, if you knew no one else would know, would you read your Bible at all? Now, these aren't, these aren't condemnation questions. These are just questions <laughs> that I'm grappling with. If no one would ever know, would you continue serving if you didn't really have to and you knew you wouldn't feel guilty afterwards? No one's going to know if you continue or not. Would we really do that? Would you come if you didn't know anyone here? Would we worship or enjoy the preaching even if we didn't like it? And would we stay? 
or would we leave? You see, what I'm coming down to is I believe we ha we've come to church a lot of times for a lot of other reasons than Jesus. We come for a lot of host of reasons. And do you know what Jesus did with this incredible crowd that was around him? Uh, he challenged their thinking. He called them to a deeper walk with him. And the result, well, I guarantee it wasn't a bestseller. <laughs> the results of the things that he said did not create a good movie. Nobody wanted to hear it. Look at verse 66 and verse 67. After he challenged them with some different thoughts and why they were following him, here's what happened. From the, that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him what? No more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? They walked away because when Jesus tried to DTR, define the relationship, why are you following me? Why do you want to see these miracles? Why do you want to know me? Why do you want to be in heaven? Why do you want to know God? Why do you want to know the scriptures? That's the questions we need to grapple with. Why? Why are you here? Why am I here? They walked away when he began to deal with them, and they, he showed them what following him really means, and they said, you know what? I don't think I really want that. Let's give you the second question. This one's a little bit shorter. Number two, are you all in? If you answer the first one right, you'll get the second one right usually. Why are you here? Number two, are you all in? Let me, let me under, help you understand this. Being a follower of Jesus requires complete commitment. There's, there's no other way to do that. Uh, he or she will do whatever it takes to follow Jesus. There's absolute loyalty <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is like shot, and absolute willingness there. There's an absolute readiness to serve with all they are and all they have. It's all for Jesus now. When you come in that kind of relationship with him, you understand that he died for you and you're ready to die for him. That's the relationship you have with him. You're inseparable in that. In America, you know what we're good at? We're good at customizing our Christianity. Uh, in other words, we accept what we like, and we cut out what we don't. We accept what we like, and we cut out what we don't. I gave a few examples here. I want you to look at these. I like following, except when it comes to changing my mind. <laughs> let, that, let that sink in there for a second. I like following only when I get to lead. Think about it. <laughs> We do, don't we? I like following when I am made to feel good. And I like following when I get to do what I like. You see how we customize Christianity very quickly? We've moved away from a cross, and we've moved away to something that's a lot more padded, a lot more comfortable, a lot more nice to wear every day. Something that fits our culture, something that fits our style, something that fits our, our, our neighborhood, whatever it is but we customize it down to where it fits us better. You know, when I was uh, pretty lost and broken and Christ came into my life uh, so many years ago, I, I really came to re realization that you are Lord. And, and whatever you lead me to do, whatever you ask me to do, uh, whatever you want to change in me, go ahead. I... I just recognized that, and I knew I needed to get to that point or else things weren't going to go any further in this relationship. I had to come to that point. I gave him every right to my life. Why? Because I wanted to. I wanted to give myself to him because he gave himself to me. I just thought that's the right thing to do. And I think the point is you and I know, I'm not sure there's any other way of following Jesus Christ. I don't know if there's another real way to do that other than just saying whatever you want. Whatever, Lord, I'm all in. <laughs> I don't know that there is a, a way to bargain with God or, or to barter with God or to finagle with. I don't think there is. So with him, it, it really is all or nothing. If you've answered why you're here, then you'll be, you can pretty easily figure out 
if you're all in. And if you weren't here for the right reasons, chances are you're probably not really all in yet. But let's get to the last one. Have you made it your own? <clears throat> Have you made it your own? Um, how many of you, let, let's take a poll here. Uh, how many of you started church because of a parent or parents? You started coming because of your parent or parents? Majority of us, good. Yeah, that's what I figured. Um, Seems like that's the case in most American homes. Uh, mom made you, or dad said you had to, or both were, were pushing you in the car, dragging you in the car, whatever they needed to do. There really wasn't an option. Maybe you started coming because of a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or you saw a girl you liked going to church, and so you began to go to church. Whatever the case is, maybe it was your spouse, uh, whatever the case is. You come because they like it when you come. Or you had to come. You come because it appeases someone else. The problem with that is, what if they stopped coming? And what if they stopped asking you to come? What if mom and dad are gone now, and you grow up, and you can make your own choices now? Would you continue to come then? Here's what we're getting at. And I, I want to share this, and I hope you don't hate me. <clears throat> after this, uh, <clears throat> I believe here's, here's one of our problems in America uh, that I've seen it all my life. I was raised in the Nazarene church and all that. So I have a pretty decent picture after 44 years. Um, <clears throat> I believe at times we have fallen in love with a sentiment of the church and not with Christ. We've fallen in love with the sentiment of the church. We've come to know the songs, the service flow, the prayer times, and the preaching, and the invitation time, and it's all we call the church. We enjoy the church. We enjoy the parts of the church, the, the segments of the church. We enjoy church. There's, we just we like it. And what we don't like, for the most part, that's why you're here tonight, what you don't like, you just kind of put up with and you go on. There's things that... We all don't like. We understand that, so we just get past those. But for the most part, we like the church. That's why we're here. If anyone wants to change things, though, let me get to this. It's sacrilegious. Why? Because it's not because it's sinful. It's just not the church we fell in love with. Here's my point. Thus, the church hasn't been about Jesus to begin with. It's been about what we have liked and loved about the church. And as long as things have stayed the same, we feel good and we feel spiritual. But when things change, we don't associate that with Jesus anymore. What happens is we fall in love with the things of the church, but not the builder of the church. We don't know him so do you see the problem in America? We have to fall in love with Jesus Christ again. Now, the church is wonderful, and there's a lot of great things we can love about the church. But folks, tomorrow morning, if the church burns down, we pray that it doesn't. But guess what? Jesus Christ is still why we live. <laughs> it's still who we serve. He is still the Lord of the church. So whether we have this or not, whether we have music or not, we still have the church. And we still have a relationship with the Savior of the world. Don't fall in love with the church as much as fall in love with Jesus. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Do I worship my parents' church? When you talk about making it your own, what are we really saying? What is my own? My own relationship with Jesus. Not my parents, not anybody else's. Do I worship my parents' church or do I worship Christ? Have I had a real experience with Jesus Christ in my own life? Not what my parents have taught me, not what anybody else has said, but do I know him in a real, a real way that he touched me and I understand who he is? Christ isn't about the church, but the church is about Christ. Christ isn't about the church. The church is about Christ. Don't get those mixed up. 
He must become personal. He must become real to my personal life. I have to know him. It's not about mom. It's not about dad. It's not about a spouse. It's not about a friend. It's about you and Jesus Christ. That's why this is so important. Define the relationship. Let me close. Begin your search today. Begin to allow God to search your own heart through this time. Those of you who love Jesus, it's going to be a wonderful experience. It's going to be a new adventure for you. Those of you who are, are maybe kind of casual, your fans right now, I pray that something would just strike you and you begin to realize Jesus needs all of me. He doesn't just want me to shout his praises. He doesn't just want me to just stand for him or, or do things for him. No, no. He wants all of me following him. Are we a follower of Jesus or just a fan? I want you to start reading your book, start attending the small groups on Wednesdays, um, or Steve's on his day that he does it. Grab a devotional journal if you want to. Grab your Bible and begin to find Christ for yourself. For yourself. Put aside everything else that you've learned. Try to be as, as uh, objective as you can in this search. Allow him to speak to you. Not what you've known before, not what you've heard before. Allow him to become real to you, fresh and anew. I want to ask uh, Sarah Lynn for just a moment. She'll come and just uh, play something softly for us. But would you stand together? We're going to close in prayer, but I, I just want you to pray for your, your own little world, your, your life right now. We're not really going to have an invitation <clears throat> because one of the things that Jesus always did was he always wanted people to count the cost. This week you're just going to count, all right? Count that cost of where you are in that relationship. And begin to understand, Lord, <clears throat> I see what you're asking me. I want to know that I'm ready to make that full commitment to you. So we're just going to pray about that. Would you bow your heads with me? <clears throat> Savior of the world, thank you that you didn't come just to make us comfortable or happy or make things fun. Those are byproducts of knowing you, Lord. But you came to make us righteous and holy and pure so that we would be reconciled to you and to the Father so that one day our names would be written in the Lamb's book of life and we would enter into that glorious kingdom one day. But Lord, I, t I ask you today, define my relationship with you. Reveal through your blessed Holy Spirit where I'm at, Lord. It's not my mom or my dad's religion anymore. I love them, I appreciate them, but I can't get to heaven because of them. And Lord, it's not this church or it's not another Nazarene church that's going to save anybody. Lord, churches don't save people. Only you do. So Lord, would we put aside all that we've learned and all we've known from church so we can clear away the clutter and see you. And you would penetrate our hearts and our minds and you'd begin to speak to us through the next few weeks about where we are with you. Why are we here, Lord? Why am I here tonight? And Lord, we need to answer these questions to you. Help us, we pray, throughout these next few weeks. Challenge us. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.